It is Wednesday, June 29th, 2022. We're here tonight to study from the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We are heading for Genesis chapter 10 tonight. So if you want to get a Bible and have it open to Genesis chapter 10, we'll get there in just a moment. But we're glad that you found us tonight. We would certainly invite you to join us this coming Sunday morning at 930 for Bible study and also 1030 for worship. And as always, if you have any questions about what you see or hear in our class tonight, give me a call at 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. In terms of good news, I got to go kayaking again this week. So I know it's not really Bible related, but sometimes we're able to share some good news. This is something good that happened in my life uh, yesterday morning. I found that... Uh, uh, kayaking helps me, and uh, some of you know that I have never been interested in going to a gym. I just can't do it. I need to have a, a destination, I think, something to accomplish. Many years ago, our whole family went to a nutritionist, and the nutritionist said, well, you know, what do you guys do for exercise? And our kids were really young at that time, and they said, well, sometimes we ride our bikes to Mickey's Dairy Bar, and sometimes we ride our bikes to the ice cream shop down in Verona, and and they kept going on and on like that, and she said, so um, <laughs> does any of your exercise in your family not involve food? And, uh, well, actually, it doesn't. <laughs> it always involves food, so um, I think that's continued on. This was uh, what I did yesterday morning, but I found that kayaking goes well with running, so there's the cardio and running, then there's the upper body workout with the paddling. And we found a decent sit-on-top kayak at Farm and Fleet a couple years ago at the beginning of the pandemic. I think it was, you know, 50% off, and then it was a, a clearance percentage off of that. So we got it down to a great price, and it has been a wonderful blessing. Uh, social distancing to the extreme would be one way of putting that. Uh, yesterday morning, I put in at Lottis Park in Monona, right off Broadway, and I was so careful Monday night to get my $8 boat launch parking permit online. So I had to log in to the Dane County Parks website. You put in the credit card information, the mailing address, phone number, all of that. And print it out, put it on the dashboard. I get that all set. And then I walk up to the actual boat launch and they have a a permit machine that's broken and then there is a, a sign on the machine that basically says free parking today so all of that for nothing but I got a kick out of that anyway I paddled down the Yahara River under the belt line around Gilligan's Island which is visible from the belt line uh, through Upper Mud Lake and then across the top edge of Lake Wabisa and then ended up at the Green Lantern in McFarland where my wife was waiting for me uh, they had good walleye for breakfast, and then I paddled back north to the car. Lots of critters along the way. I'm not sure whether this is a, a heron or a crane in the in the photograph here. I am not a, a bird person. Maybe some of you will know. I looked it up online, tried to compare it, and it looks like mainly it's the size. is how you distinguish between the two, and I didn't have two side by side, so I have no concept of how big this thing was or how much of his legs were under the water there. But anyway, there were ducks, turtles, tons of fish along the way. But uh, anyway, that is my good news very briefly for this week, and I hope that your week is going well as well. Well, tonight we're back to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, written primarily by Moses. We've just finished looking at the Great Flood over the past several weeks, and tonight we get to a huge list of names. A lot of names in chapter 10. Basically, it is a form of a genealogy. And I know in studying the Bible, it is tempting to skip over chapters like this. We could have very easily just said, okay, Genesis 9, next week we're doing chapter 11, and just we could have skipped over chapter 10 completely. And obviously, many of these names are hard to pronounce. These are names from thousands of years ago, and very few of these names seem to have uh, any practical application for any of us. So we look at these names and we're like, what in the world? Why uh, Why are we looking at this? Why is there uh, any value in doing this? But obviously there is some value to studying these huge lists of names in the Bible. They're there for a reason. Uh, first of all, when we come to a list of names like we have tonight, I think, it, I think it helps us remind ourselves that these are real people that uh, the Bible is a book of history. This is not once upon a time in a land far, far away with a bunch of made-up stuff, but these are real people. The Bible is not a work of fiction, but these are real people who lived in real places, and we're going to see some of these names and places tonight. Uh, secondly, and somewhat related to this, it helps to personalize some of these characters, to know where they came from especially when we get down to some of the more famous characters like Noah and like Abraham in a few weeks here, 
Uh, but it helps to know where they came from, where they lived, how they got to where they ended up, who their parents were, who their kids were, and how uh, some of these major characters are related to each other and how they fit into the larger timeline. So we're not just looking at a sporadic little bits and pieces here and there of various Bible characters, but the genealogies in these lists of names uh, certainly help us to put all of this together. And that's what helps keep us interested in the Bible over a lifetime. It's not just a, a straight up list of rules to remember, but there there is a storyline here. And these are actual people that we can get familiar with over our lifetime. And I know today when we meet someone, if you meet somebody, you know, a new employee at work or some visitor at church or something like that, it's a common thing among people to try to find common ground. Oh, you're from this country. I know people from this country as well. And, and we start making connections and eventually we can probably find people that we have in common. And often this comes through the family tree. Oh, I've got an aunt and uncle that live there and, and that kind of thing. And so it helps us to become personally familiar with some of these Bible characters. Thirdly, and somewhat related to the first two, all of this eventually points to Jesus. And we need to know where Jesus came from. And the list of names throughout the Bible certainly helps to establish this. And a lot of the genealogies are in there for that reason, just leading us from Adam to the Lord Jesus and how he got to where he was. And then finally, this list of names in particular that we're looking at tonight helps to explain how the earth is populated after the flood how certain people end up in certain places. So this is the history, not just of people, but of nations. And I think that'll be more clear as we work through chapter 10 tonight. Well, with this as background, let's look at the text itself. Genesis chapter 10, God put these verses here for a reason. We are not skipping over this chapter. Um, and with that said, I, I will also say that I predict tonight's class may be a little bit shorter than most, and that's okay. But let's look at the text itself. This is Genesis chapter 10, and let's start with the first paragraph, Genesis 10, verses 1 through 5. Genesis 10, 1 through 5. Now, these are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz and Ripha and Togermah. The sons of Javan were Elisha and Tarshish, Katim, Dadanim. From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, every one according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. Well, in the first verse, then, we have a preview of the whole chapter. Moses is about to tell us about the descendants of Noah. You may remember we had another genealogy back in Genesis 5, bringing us from Adam to Noah. But now, due to the flood, Noah is basically starting over, isn't he? So that whole genealogy narrows down to one man. And so now we have a list starting with Noah and bringing us up to the events of chapter 11 and beyond. And in this chapter, as outlined in verse 1, we'll be looking at the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, I believe this is the birth order, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. However, this is not the order we find them in this chapter. And I think the reason is Shem is the most important due to Shem being in the line leading to Jesus. And Moses will often save the best for last, as we might say today. And this seems to be uh, perhaps what he does here. So we start then with the sons of Japheth. As far as I can tell, this is not an exhaustive list. Obviously, this is not every son born to Japheth. This is not all of his children. This is not a list of everybody who's ever been born in the history of the earth. Oh, but these are some of the highlights, and as with some of the names in this chapter, I'm assuming they meant uh, more to the people reading Genesis for the first time than they may mean to us today, and that's okay. In other words, when Moses writes this down in the 1400s BC, uh, people could have probably very easily identified uh, the places and the names and the nations that he describes in this chapter in a way that we may not be able to understand today. Otherwise, uh, what is the point of writing this down? I'm just saying that there must have been a point to this in times past, and some of this we might be able to figure out today with study and research, but the rest of it may be kind of lost to us, at least at this point. I think we've said a number of times through the years that the deeper we dig, archaeologically speaking, the deeper we dig, the better it'll be for the Christian faith, and I think that's certainly true in this chapter. So there may be names in this chapter that we don't recognize, 
Uh, but there are discoveries waiting to be found over there in the Middle East and really all around the world that may shed light on some of these names, the kind of light that we really don't have on some of these at this point. I hope we notice this is not a traditional genealogy. I think we're getting the, the feel for this here in the opening verses. It's not like the one we had in Genesis chapter 5. There are similarities, but it's not a complete parallel. This isn't a description, in other words, of a guy having a son who had a son who had a son and so on in chronological birth order. Uh, but instead, the emphasis here is on the settling of land and on the development of nations and their dividing up according to languages. Uh, remember back in Genesis 9, God said to Noah and his sons in verse 1, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And then again in verse 7 of chapter 9, as for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. Genesis 10, therefore, is a record of how that happens. And again, it's not a traditional genealogy with the begats as uh, some of the other transla older translations have it. Uh, but this is simply a record of Noah and his family populating and filling uh, the earth. We see this in verses 2 through 5. We have a list of names. In verse 4, we have a reference to Tarshish. Uh, that's one of those that seems familiar. Tarshish, I believe, is located on the southern coast of Spain. And it's found in the Bible elsewhere, isn't it? If you remember, this is where Jonah tried to go instead of going to Nineveh. So he went <laughs> the completely wrong way, didn't he? He went west instead of going to the northeast where Nineveh was located. So there is a familiar name. This is one that does, in fact, have some significance to us. Uh, then in verse 5, after this list of names, notice Moses says, From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands. Uh, so as Moses writes this then, he's explaining this to the nation of Israel. This is how these people got to where they are today. Uh, they are the descendants of Japheth. We should also note that people are separated, each one according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. The fact that they're separated according to their language, I think, tells us that the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 probably gets inserted somewhere here in chapter 10. So again, chapter 11 is not in chronological order, but we have a list of names and where they spread to in chapter 10. And chapter 11 uh, tells us why they spread to these various nations. But we'll get back to chapter 11 in a few weeks. Well, let's continue with the descendants now of Ham in Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20. Genesis 10, verses 6 through 20. The sons of Ham were Cush and Mizraim and Put and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba and Havilah and Sabta and Ramah and Sabteca. And the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From that land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh and Reboth Ur and Kela, and resin between Nineveh and Kela, that is the great city. Mizraim became the father of Ludim and Anamim and Lehabim and Naphtuhim and Pathrusim and Kasluhim, from which came the Philistines and Kaphtorim. Canaan became the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. And the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvadite, and the Zemarite, and the Hamathite. And afterward, the families of the Canaanite were spread abroad. The territory of the Canaanite extended from Sidon as you go toward Gerar, as far as Gaza, as you go toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, by their nations. Well, we have several notes on this paragraph, starting with a reference to Canaan. Notice the first reference up in verse 6. We find Canaan is a descendant of Ham. And then skipping down to verse 19, Moses explains the territory of the Canaanites. We have the note that the descendants of Ham settled in the area towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And obviously our ears perk up, I think, when we hear that. These are names that are familiar to us. Ultimately, these two cities were known for being completely immoral. And here Moses is saying this is where they came from. They were the descendants of Ham. And this was important for the Israelites to understand as they travel through the wilderness, as Moses write these words, writes these words, 
uh, they are heading toward the land of Canaan, aren't they? And they will eventually have the job of removing the Canaanites from the promised land. But in Genesis 10, Moses gives them the history of these people. They are the descendants of Ham. And this is something uh, that you may want to know because you'll be getting more familiar with them as we enter into the promised land. Well, a good chunk of this section concerns a descendant of Ham by the name of Nimrod. In verse 8, uh, Nimrod is described as a mighty man on the earth, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Uh, the scholars tell us that Nimrod was not necessarily a hunter of animals, but perhaps a hunter of people. And that's something I didn't realize. At least I don't remember thinking about that before until we uh, did the study for tonight's lesson. And so the idea is not that he was out there hunting deer necessarily, but perhaps that he was hunting human beings, that he was a mighty warrior, he was a conqueror. Uh, maybe a more accurate way of thinking about Nimrod. I'm just saying that is a possibility here based on the wording. And the fact that he does this before the Lord, uh, some commentators have pointed out, may carry the idea that he does this blatantly and rebelliously, or he does this despite the Lord, or he does this in the Lord's face, uh, disobeying the commandment that we are not to kill each other. And that may be the uh, meaning behind these verses. So Nimrod then was perhaps rebellious. Uh, the Islamic faith, by the way, believes that Nimrod and his people were basically at war with Abraham and his people. And I think that really uh, fits in with what we learned later in the Old Testament. Today, I believe we have a line of RVs or uh, like travel trailers going by the name Nimrod. At least I remember seeing that on the road in times past. I don't think I've seen them lately. I don't know if they're still in business. I didn't research that. Um, and Nimrod is also a, a pretty cool insult, isn't it? It's hard to say that word without snickering a little bit. Uh, it's almost fun to say, just to say the word Nimrod. And uh, very cautiously, I, I looked into the history of using the word Nimrod as an insult. And you can go down paths online, of course, and get yourself into trouble. But uh, it seems that we have a reference in Ben Hecht and Gene Fowler's 1932 play, The Great Magoo. And that's one of the early uh, references to using this word as an insult. They use Nimrod to refer to a man who relentlessly pursues women. And so, in a sense, he was a hunter of women. And that's how they got this great hunter idea, and they use that as an insult. So, I think in the play, they say he's in love with her. That makes about the tenth, the same old Nimrod. He won't let her alone for a second. And that's in the play. So, in that context, Nimrod describes a hunter of women, somebody who's always going after women. That's how they used that back in the 1930s or 40s, or I guess whenever that was. Uh, most of us maybe are a little bit more familiar with Elmer Fudd. I believe Daffy Duck may be the first to refer to Elmer Fudd as a Nimrod. I think the first reference I could find was back in 1947, I believe. And uh, many seem to remember Bugs Bunny referring to Elmer Fudd as Nimrod, uh, but nobody seems to be able to find that original reference. And I did not, in the name of research, go back and watch all of the history of Bugs Bunny for uh, the preparation of tonight's lesson. But I think we see the connection. Um, if the original Nimrod was a mighty hunter, uh, Elmer Fudd was not quite the mighty hunter, was he? And so this was a dismissive insult, <laughs> I would say, uh, like referring to somebody as a genius when they are clearly not a genius. You know, they do something remarkably ungenius like and you say, way to go, genius. And I think that may be the way that Daffy Duck was referring to Elmer Fudd, you know, way to go, Nimrod. You know, you think you're the great hunter, but but you aren't. So um, Elmer Fudd was a Nimrod. Boy, this has been a weird discussion in a Bible class, hasn't it? But I'm just saying, we hear that word and our ears perk up. This is familiar to us. And so that is uh, that is the history of it. I thought you might appreciate that. Uh, but notice how Nimrod and his people settle in Babel uh, and in the land of Shinar. As I understand it, this would be the, the land of the Babylonians uh, further uh, northwest in the Fertile Crescent. And the Babylonians were consistently enemies of God's people, weren't they? And I think we understand the uh, reference from uh, the Islamic faith that uh, Nimrod was at war with Abraham and his descendants. Uh, we could say the same thing about the Assyrians, couldn't we, that are mentioned there in verse 11 and the reference to Nineveh also in verse 11. Remember how much Jonah hated Nineveh. They were enemies. And uh, that is certainly reflected here. This is the history of that. So Moses then is simply explaining where these people came from. They are the descendants of Han. 
In verses 13 through 18, we have a list of those who settled in and around the promised land. The Canaanites are here, as we noted earlier, but there are others that may be familiar to us as well. The Philistines, uh, I think the first reference to Philistines in the Bible, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and so on. These are names that are familiar to us. And they're familiar because these are the tribes, these are the nations that the Israelites interacted with through the years. And Moses is simply explaining who they are and where they came from. They are all the descendants of Ham. It all goes back to Noah and his sons. And then we get to the last verse here, which is almost identical to the summary of the sons of Japheth in verse 5. Uh, these are the sons of Ham according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, by their nations. So these then are the descendants of Ham. Uh, let's continue tonight with the descendants of Shem. This is Genesis chapter 10, verses 21 through 32. So I think this is our last paragraph tonight uh, with the uh, the third group here, according to the sons of Noah. So the, the descendants of Shem. This is Genesis chapter 10, verses 21 through 32. Also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, and the older brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem were Elam and Ashur and Arkpachshad and Lud and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz and Hul and Gether and Mash. Arkpachshad became the father of Shelah, and Shelah became the father of Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of the, the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan became the father of Almodad and Sheleph and Hazar Maveth and Jera, and Hadaram and Uzal and Dikla and Obal and Abimael and Sheba, and Ophir and Havilah and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. Now their settlement extended from Mesha as you go toward Sephar, the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. And then verse 32 there at the end, these are the families of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies, by their nations. And out of these nations were separated on the earth after the flood. Again, a bunch of names. Um, and uh, Shem up there, these are his descendants. Eber, I guess I should have pointed out. A lot of people think that that was the uh, origin uh, origin of the, the word Hebrew, Eber. You can kind of see a little bit of similarity there. But uh, Peleg is one of the big names that uh, has always been interesting to me. Uh, here in the middle, Peleg was his name for in his days the earth was divided. And there are two main theories on this. First of all, uh, this may refer to the Tower of Babel incident from chapter 11 that we're getting to in a few weeks, the chapter that comes after this. Um, in his days, God confused the language of the people. Everybody spread out. And this might be it. And I think I would lean heavily toward this being it. Most of the commentaries were leaning in this direction. Uh, there is a second just remote possibility that I should mention because it has been mentioned out there if you study this in depth. And uh, that is that in his days, the earth was divided uh, literally, not just by language, but literally physically. Uh, most of us, I think, are familiar with the concept of Pangea, uh, the theory of an ancient supercontinent. And I know, you know, we studied this in school. When we look at a map of the world, North and South America seem to fit pretty well, don't they, with uh, Europe and Africa. And the theory is... Um, they were together, but at some point they separated, and I think they're still on the move, like a millimeter or two a year or something like that. I'm not sure, but that's the concept very slowly. And of course, evolutionary theory says that this happened very slowly over millions upon millions of years, but there is a chance that this happened suddenly and catastrophically in the days of a man named Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Um, but these are two of the leading possibilities divided by language at Babel, which I think is by far the most likely scenario here. But let's just be open to the fact or the, open to the possibility that it may be talking about the earth being divided literally or physically in some kind of, I mean, amazingly catastrophic, uh, cataclysmic event. If you could imagine one continent breaking apart and uh, drifting in different directions very violently. At least that uh, is at least one possibility here. Uh, in verse 31, we have what is now the standard summary for each of Noah's three sons. These are the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. And then finally, to summarize all of it, we come down to verse 32 at the end. These are the families of the sons of Noah, 
according to their genealogies by their nations, and out of these the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. So Genesis 10 is not just a list of names. It's, it's not something we should really um, just skip over. It's something we do need to read. Of course, if we were together, I would have loved asking some of you to read, <laughs> read this chapter instead of me. Um, these are some names that we have difficulty pronouncing, but uh, these names are given to explain how people got so spread out all over the face of the earth. They did not stay together. And God certainly played a role in this, as we'll see when we get to Genesis chapter 11 in a few weeks. Uh, by the way, Paul refers to this, this development of the concept of nations. He refers to this in his sermon on the Areopagus in Athens, Greece, over in Acts 17, 24 through 27, when he says, The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. I just hope we notice there in Acts 17 that God created nations. Yes, God created Adam as an individual. He created Eve as an individual. He put them together in a family. God therefore created the family. But he also created the idea of nations. And we see this in Genesis chapter 10 as people divided along the lines of language, which we'll get to in the next chapter. So we have a list of 70 nations in this chapter. Some people have made a big deal about this. The number of 70 does seem significant in the Bible. Uh, maybe it's significant here, maybe not, but I just wanted to point that out before we close tonight. Well, this brings us to the end of our study tonight, this coming Sunday afternoon, right after worship. We hope to head to Florida for the next two and a half weeks. Um, I've only been to Florida once in my life that I know of, a quick visit to uh, Disney World with a friend of mine in high school over spring break way back when, and I told myself then I have no plans to ever go back. I remember getting off the plane and getting hit by a wall of air, you know, growing up in the Chicago area with the, the cool, low humidity, and then walking down there, and it was like I got punched in the chest, uh, walking out of the airport there at Orlando and uh, glasses fogging up and and that was like in in spring break so now we're going back in the summer and i'm hearing it's in the 90s um and total complete humidity you guys know i like the snow i'm gonna have a hard time with this but uh we're, we're heading down there i'm scheduled to speak at the church in key west florida on july 9th or uh, july uh, 17th rather july 17th and i'll try to say more about that this sunday uh, but with me being out of town, we'll have someone else filling in for the next three Wednesdays. In the past, Josh Yancey was able to both teach and do the tech part of it. And there is some, I guess, skill. you got to know something about this, and it's kind of difficult to pass this off to another person for a couple weeks. And uh, with Josh being uh, out of town or having moved now, we'll be using material from World Video Bible School and Apologetics Press as we have a time or two over the past year or so. I've been surveying some videos that are associated with a study of Genesis that I think will help us understand the book better and have it from another perspective, somebody other than me. And I hope to just send those links out each Wednesday. I don't think we'll be doing the... Uh, premiere where it starts at seven o'clock that uh, adds another level of complexity to it so i'll just send links out each week probably on wednesday if i have wi-fi down there and I get that to us so that we can uh, watch that whenever we have the opportunity so i'm just giving you a heads up as to what's coming up over the next few weeks so the next voice you hear on wednesday will not be mine unless of course uh, a hurricane wipes out florida and we need to postpone our trip but uh, we're hoping that does not happen uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 9.30 for class. Read First and Second Thessalonians before class. It'll be a blessing for you. And then join us at 10.30 for our worship assembly as well. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of all the earth, King of all nations. Thank you for giving us your word and thank you for explaining how the earth was repopulated so quickly and so thoroughly after the flood. Be with us, Father, and give us strength. Help us keep up the struggle against sin. We ask for opportunities to help and encourage each other, brothers and sisters, in the Lord. 
Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you in the name of Jesus, our King. Amen.